So hopefully everybody can see the screen and I'm going to start my talk, which is going to be about freedom seekers and uh, archeology span that's been done to date and what we're hoping to do at the Uncle Tom's Cabin historic site in uh, Canada. Now, as Stacy mentioned, I work for an agency, the government of Ontario. Now we own 197 uh, properties across Ontario. And a lot of these are natural heritage properties. And that means uh, woodlands and pastures and wetlands. And uh, we've done a lot of archeology span on, uh, I wouldn't say all the properties, but as a result, our 21 archeological sites are found on our um, 21 built heritage sites. There are a couple that we have not found archeological sites on uh, to date. We also have found about 69 archeological sites on our natural heritage properties. And I've done work on those properties um, all across Southern Ontario for the most part in South Central intensively up into the Bruce Peninsula. And um, my work also takes me to working with our easement properties across the province. So we have over 270 of those and there's approximately 80-ish sites that uh, are known on those properties. And we work with the property owners, which may be private owners or public sector um, owners, such as municipalities, to ensure that archeology span is addressed whenever there are plans to alter the landscape and or even sometimes the buildings. So that just gives you a, a, a quick taste of what I've been involved with. And one of the properties we acquired in 2005 from the St. Clair um, uh, Commission was the Uncle Tom's Cabin historic site <clears throat> in Dresden, Ontario. And in 1852, Harriet Beecher Stowe wrote Uncle Tom's Cabin to show the cruelty and unjust practices of slavery. And in the first year, the book sold about 300,000 copies. And about four years later, it had sold over 2 million copies. And this novel had a profound effect on the uh, world's view of African Americans and slavery. So Stowe had written the novel as a response to the passing of the Second Fugitive Slave Act in 1850, which punished people who aided runaways and diminished the rights of uh, fugitives, if you like, as well as free blacks. And she was inspired by the 1849 autobiography by uh, Reverend Josiah Henson. Now Henson was one of the first freedom seekers from the United States to write a memoir. And Harriet Beecher Stowe acknowledged that uh, she'd met Henson and his writings inspired her novel. And Henson made tours uh, for years as the quote unquote real Uncle Tom. And in 1876, he returned uh, to England to raise funds to support himself and his family. And he also met Queen Victoria. <clears throat> now, Josiah was born into slavery in Maryland. And as a slave, we know from his autobiography that he experienced horrifying conditions. Upper Canada became a haven for freedom seekers from the United States after 1793, when uh, Lieutenant Governor John Gray Simcoe passed an act to prevent the further introduction of slaves and to limit the term of contracts for servitude in this province. Now, while this uh, statute did not free slaves living in Upper Canada, it did prohibit the importation of slaves into uh, the area. This meant that uh, freedom seekers from slavery were free as soon as they set foot in Upper Canada. And by the time Henson decided to leave the United States, Black communities in Upper Canada consisted of Black loyalists who had fought for the British during the um, American Revolution, African American refugees from the War of 1812, and others who had fled slavery. Now with his first um, wife, Charlotte, and four children. Henson escaped to Canada traveling <clears throat> on the Underground Railway through Indiana and Ohio. And then he sailed across Lake Erie to Buffalo and crossed the Niagara River on October 28, 1830 
ending up in Fort Erie, where he looked for work. He and Charlotte had at least 12 children, but Charlotte passed away in 1852, and in 1856, Henson remarried, and he married Nancy Gamble, who was a widowed free Black woman. Now, this slide just shows you um, the, some of the roots that are known uh, for people who are seeking freedom into Canada. And this slide shows you a number of the communities across the southern part of uh, Ontario where people sought to begin their life of freedom. And here you see a photograph of Josiah with his second wife, Nancy. Now, his date of birth has been a question mark because in his autobiography, he said it was 1789, but uh, an archeologist I've been working with down in Maryland, Julie, Julie King, has actually looked at Port Tobacco and the plantation site that he was born on, where his parents were. And it doesn't make any sense with um, who. Josiah says he remembers being the, the owner of the plantation. And it seems like it, it may have been a typo in his autobiography. We think that his actual date of birth may be 1798, not 1789. Now, we know that Josiah stayed in the Fort Erie area for a while, and then he spent three years working as a laborer on the farm of a Mr. Hibbard in the Kitchener-Waterloo area. And then he worked for a Mr. Risley for about a year on that man's farm. And Henson was also known at that time to have preached in the area. This all occurs between 1830 and 1834. And by some time in 1834, Josiah then led a group of 12 people down to the Colchester area on Lake Erie. And uh, they rented land from the government and the intent was to run a communal farm. But we know during the rebellion in 1837-38 of Upper Canada, <clears throat> which um, was basically an insurrection against the government, <clears throat> Hanson had a company of black volunteers attached to the Essex militia. And they captured a schooner called the Anne and made prisoners of its crew. And his unit also defended Fort Malden in Amherstburg from Christmas 1837 to about uh, early spring in 1838. And it was in Colchester um, a few years later that Josiah met Hiram Wilson, who was sent by the Anti-Slavery Society to minister to Canadian Blacks. And with the help of Wilson, an asylum partner, who was a Quaker philanthropist, um, 200 acres in the Dawn Township was purchased. And Josiah was also able to purchase 200 acres for himself. And around 1841-42 is when Henson and his family moves up into the Dresden area. Now, he, he, Josiah was known as one of the founders of the settlement and school for other slaves, at, refugee slaves um, at Dresden and known as the Dawn Settlement. <clears throat> now the Dawn Settlement was based on the creation of the British American Institute, an all ages manual labor and technical school that uh, trained teachers and provided a general education for all others. The settlement also operated a brickyard, a sawmill, a gristmill, and a hemp rope yard. The school opened in 1842 and had by 1845 about 60 to 70 students. Now at that time, blacks were not allowed into the common school system. So they set up their own school. And the teachers were the community's religious leaders and their wives. Henson also preached in the Dawn Settlements Church and was viewed as a spiritual leader of the community. And the church was the British Methodist Episcopal Church. Now, <clears throat> immediately north of the British American Institute lands, so now we're going a, a little bit across the Sydenham River, <clears throat> there was a Survey 127 of the original community of Dresden, surveyed in 1853. And with uh, a few exceptions, there were about 100 properties that were purchased by a partnership of free men abolitionists made up of Dennis Hill, James Whipper Purnell, William Goodrich, and Absalom Shad. All of these individuals were connected with William Whipper. You see, Whipper was a prominent station master on the Underground Railroad and smuggled hundreds of fugitives north, as had Henson. 
Whipper's sister, Marianne, married James Hollinsworth and settled in Dresden. Whipper came to Dresden in the 1850s, but it was really his sister and two of his brothers and his sister's husband who oversaw Whipper's um, investments in Dresden. Whipper was one of the wealthiest black men in North America at that time, turning his wealth and business talent to banking, the purchase of uh, railway cars and stocks, milling, coal, and real estate development. He used his rail cars to provide shelter for slaves seeking freedom, primarily from Virginia and Maryland, moving them north. By the 1850s, so what do we know about the Dawn Settlement? Not a great deal, other than the institutional aspects. What we suspect at this point is that there seemed to be a distinction between what the Dawn Settlement was versus the Dawn Institute Farm versus the British American Institute. And this has over time resulted in the term Dawn becoming the official name of the 300 acre parcel affiliated with the school and farm. As a settlement area by blacks, this area surrounding Dresden had already begun in earnest by 1825 and possibly earlier. And by the time the BAI was created, there were already 50 black families established in the area by 1841 too. It was after this time that the area surrounding and including Dresden became a catalyst for independent black investment like by William Whipper. And to be truthful, the Dawn settlement as Marie Carter, a local historian has said, is somewhat of a moving target. It's ideologically charged and open as a result to inconsistencies in the historical record as a geographical place. Now, until 1868, Josiah Henson served regularly on the Institute's executive committee, which not only directed the school, but oversaw the farms, the gristmill, the sawmill, brickyard, and rope factory, which the settlement undertook. Yet he was never the official administrative head. That was a role always filled by a white man. Throughout, however, Henson functioned as patriarch of Dawn and as, as a spokesman for Canada's growing black um, population. In both capacities, he raised funds during tours of the American Midwest, New England and New York between 1843 and 1847, as well as uh, in Britain in 1849 to 52. And the longest serving trustee of the BAI was J.C. Brown, who was credited with saving it as an African Canadian directed institution. Brown was also co-founder of the Wilberforce colony located near Lucan. And later he was instrumental in establishing the Wilberforce Educational Institute in Chatham. Now we know that the Dawn settlers cleared their land and grew crops, mainly wheat, corn, oats, and tobacco, and exported locally grown black walnut lumber to Britain and the United States. At its peak, there was about 500 people who lived at the Dawn settlement. Many of the farms in this area today are still owned by sixth and seventh generation descendants of the first freedom seekers to own property here. And within the town of Dresden, there's approximately 10 to 12 families who are descendants of freedom seekers. Now, as noted, originally these farms were mixed farming operations. They also raised livestock, <clears throat> such as pigs and cattle, and eventually established orchard, sorry, orchard crops, uh, particularly mm -hmm. apples. And those former slaves who fled Virginia are credited with introducing new crops to the area. Uh, tobacco in particular, and two former Virginians introduced hemp. So these were new sources of economic wealth in the area in the early years of the community. Newspaper accounts speak of a rope bridge made of hemp grown and harvested by local farmers and constructed by the BAI that spanned the Sydenham River. Now this would have facilitated travel to the BAI's lands across the river in the 1840s. Now the Sydenham River itself in the 1850s and 60s connected Dresden to Detroit and the Great Lakes. While many people of African descent made up as much as 80% of the early population of Dresden, a number of white entrepreneurs of Scottish, Irish and German descent were neighbors and established businesses within the Dresden community. Men like Alexander Trieris and his father-in-law, William Wright, became closely entwined with their black neighbors, resulting in intimate involvement in the faith of the black owned institutions. 
Dawn developed administrative problems, which were quite complicated and I'm not gonna go into. And in 1849, the British and Foreign Anti-Slavery Society took over its management. And at about this time, Henson was under scrutiny and much of this tension had to do with conflicts that he was having uh, with the official administrators. Now this had caused the resignation of Wilson, Hiram Wilson in 1847, and the short tenure of Samuel Davis. And then John Scoble stayed at Dawn for about 16 years and tangled with Henson numerous times over property sales and subsequent lawsuits. From 1863 to 1868, Trurice was named the receiver of the BAI lands, managing its business affairs at a time when its ownership was being contested and its assets tied up in the courts. After the school closed in 1868, the settlement began to fade. Many residents of Dawn were either returned to the United States where slavery had finally been abolished or they moved to other communities and larger communities in Ontario. When the Institute closed and after John Scoble had left Dawn, the assets of the school were used to establish the Wilberforce Educational Institute in nearby Chatham. Now, after this time, the settlement more or less died out. Henson, though he stayed on in Dresden until his death, had lost his role as a black leader there in that community. Although Henson became a participant in abolitionist activity in the United States, his importance in <clears throat> Canadian history lies in his work at Dawn. And it's here that he contributed significantly to Canada's role in the North American anti-slavery crusade. Now, Josiah is the first black person to be featured on a Canadian stamp approximately a hundred years after his death. So this was in the 1980s. He was also honored by plaques by the Ontario Heritage Trust, at least the settlement was, and uh, he is a national historic figure um, uh, designated by the Historic Sites and Monuments Board of Canada. And these are just some of the remarkable sort of uh, commemorate, commemorate, sorry, commemorations of his uh, com contributions uh, to um, freedom seekers coming north. Now, the Uncle Tom's Cabin um, historic site, if you haven't been there, is located at the heart of the historic community of the British American Institute. Its lands uh, are owned and operated by the Ontario Heritage Trust. And uh, okay, I already talked about some of the things I was going to say, but what I do wanna say is that once the St. Clair Parks Commission transferred ownership to the trust, we became deeply involved in doing a number of, um, well, making a number of changes and getting involved in research. The Interpretive Center, which is located on the site today, houses a collection of 19th century artifacts and rare books pertinent to the abolitionist era, as well as displays highlighting Reverend Josiah Henson's life. The collection includes a rare early edition of Josiah's autobiography and a signed portrait of Queen Victoria presented to him in 1877. And at the Interpretive Center, you can go into the North Star Theater for a screening of a video on uh, Father, Father Henson's life. And uh, it's a live action documentary, uh, which talks about his life from birth and slavery in Maryland to his role as an abolitionist preacher, author, and co-founder of the British American Institute. Now the Underground Railroad, Railroad Freedom Gallery recounts the history of freedom seekers from being taken from Africa and enslaved in the United States um, to finding freedom in Canada. And this gallery has a, a great deal of um, exhibits which were um, changed in 2005, but recently uh, refreshed in, uh, two years ago. Um, and it's about Josiah Henson and the history of slavery um, in North America, pretty much. And we also have um, Henson's pulpit from which he preached and two chairs, which uh, were made by uh, students at the technical school using the black walnut from the area. Now the Pioneer Church, which I don't have a photograph of, I believe, dates back to 1850 and contains the organ from the original church where Reverend Henson preached in Dresden, Ontario. And the pulpit, which you just saw, is part of the exhibit gallery. And the church served as the place of worship and a center for meetings 
educational, recreational, and social activities and was integral to the Black community in Dawn. And this church was moved from the town of Wheatley, um, about 70 kilometers southwest of Dresden, to this site in 1964 by Jack Thompson and as representative of churches in which Henson preached at while living at Dawn. And in Wheatley, it was a church that served um, Presbyterian and Anglican congregations. Now the, oh, sorry, I do have a photo of the church. There you go. And this is the interior of the church. The James Harris house that you see here is thought to be a typical Dawn home of post and beam construction with clapboard siding. And the house is believed to be one of the oldest remaining structures in the Dresden area dating to circa 1890. It belonged to James Harris, who may have been related to Weldon Harris, an African-American who came to Canada seeking freedom and in 1825 purchased 50 acres to farm on lot three, concession three in Camden Township. The first floor was used for domestic purposes such as cooking, heating, and the second floor, uh, basically loft, was for sleeping. Now, Josiah Henson's house, and this is the last house that he lived in, um, we believe was constructed in around 1850 and has moved several times until it's moved to this uh, museum site, but it's always remained within the regional Dawn settlement lands. It was opened as a museum <clears throat> in the 19, late 1940s by local historian William Chapel. And um, it was moved to its present location in 1964 by then curator Jack Thompson, who as far as I know may still be um, alive with us. Um, and it was restored to an 1850 appearance in 1993-94. In this slide, you can see actually one of the actual moves of the house in the 1960s. The Henson House is also associated with the early development of heritage conservation and tourism in Ontario as a result. Architecturally significant as an example of mid 19th century vernacular domestic architecture. The two story posted beam structure stands as a visible symbol of the status and power accumulated by Henson during the latter years of his life. Now let's remember that Henson um, lived the majority of his life in Canada. So from 1830 till 1883. The house is constructed from local materials and exhibits the proportions and central hall um, plan common amongst many of the province's earliest residential structures. So what about archeology? span It's time to get to that. So knowing that all of these buildings that are in the museum complex were moved to the site it was fairly easy for me to determine that the potential for archeological um, finds were, were maybe going to be low. So in 2005, we undertook a stage one, two archeological assessment of the property. And because of new construction in the 1990s, which led to the destruction of the 1960s buildings, which used to be in this basic area, this is a great site for doing archeology span of a museum dating to the 1960s. But in terms of anything related directly to Zaya Henson, we found very little. As you can also see on the site plan to a certain degree is that um, we are limited in many areas because of septic fields, um, electrical um, lines and uh, pipes and parking lots and a lot of grading has occurred. And as a result, you know, we know that um, uh, this property seems to have only been used for agricultural use by Josiah Henson uh, throughout his lifetime. We do know where the original house stood, which was further down the road. So I figure if we wait a couple more decades, somebody's gonna be able to register this as an archeological site, but right now it's, it's, there isn't anything there to screen that Josiah Henson spent time here. It's just not that kind of a site. So, what was useful, of course, was that we have found out the location of his original house. And we also um, looked at some early maps and plans, uh, and it wasn't easy to find them because there aren't a lot in the community. Um, and there were some at the Public Archives of Canada that were um, highly useful. So this is 
you know, not my favorite time of year to dig, August in southwestern Ontario, it's very hot and humid. And, you know, if you get thrilled by finding a spork, then, then you really have a good time <laughs> at the site, because we were finding a lot of plastic artifacts. So that's what I mean. It's, it's just, unfortunately, there isn't much here for us to look for. So here you can see this is part of the 200 acre area that um, Josiah Henson um, owned property and it shows his house. And there is in our collection um, a drawing that was not included in the 1880-81 Illustrated Historical Atlas of Camden Gore that shows where Josiah's house is. But if anyone does archival research using um, illustrated atlases, you know that sometimes these are artistic renderings are, um, you know, well, horse pucky. They're not real sort of uh, depictions of what the properties in the area looks like. Um, so it's more artistic than anything else. But it does give us an understanding of this is probably where the house was located. And by using aerial photography, we've also been able to locate a number of features. But here you can see in the 1939 aerial photograph that in fact, this area, which is where the museum complex now resides, and this is one of the uh, Henson family burial ground, um, has basically been in agricultural production ever since. So adjacent to the property, so here we have the museum complex. We have two cemeteries, as I said, the Henson family cemetery, and across the road is the British American Institute Cemetery. Now the BAI cemetery sits on land that was originally part of the Willoughby Harris farm and Weldon Harris, who I mentioned early, um, earlier, <clears throat> and Levi Willoughby were two freedom seekers who established here in about 1823-25. They were among the first black settlers to purchase land after the British signed Treaty 25 with, with members of the Council of Three Fires, opening this land for settlement. Their 50 acre farm, which extended north to the Sydenham River flats was established 20 years before the BAI. So along the um, Sydenham River is a flat area believed to also be the location of the Dresden campground meetings of the 1830s. These religious gatherings attracted people from um, the surrounding you know, 40, 50 mile area. The river site continued to be used for baptisms until at least 1949. And Reverend, Reverend Harris, sorry, Reverend Henson may have participated in gatherings such as these when he first came to the area. He himself indicated that he had spoken to large mixed race gatherings of this type. Now within the Henson family cemetery is the final resting place of Josiah Henson. Newspaper accounts showed that his funeral was one of the largest ever held in Dresden's history. And his monument, which you see here, um, bears the Mason symbol and a crown, which actually represents Queen Victoria. We know Henson was a member of the Mount Moriah Masons Number no. Four at Dresden. The land was purchased from the BAI by Henson and became part of the Henson Farm in 1872. It's still an active cemetery being used by Henson's descendants, but due to records being lost over the years, knowing where every, burial is, where every burial is located proved problematic over time. Although there are headstones at the, at the cemetery, at the Henson Family Cemetery, there's only 22, and their positions don't precisely mark the underlying graves, as you'll soon see. So this is a photograph of Henson's monument, um, and the individuals are not known for certain, but there are community members. And this was taken in the 1920s. And as you can see, um, it, it actually does look quite a bit different than um, what the cemetery looks like today. There are no trees, no bushes, no beautification efforts, no fencing, very little. Now, this photograph dates to the 1940s and you're starting to see changes here simply because um, the at that time, the Imperial Order Daughters of the Empire undertook a beautification project associated with the cemetery that included plantings and you see some bushes. Um, the sign that's to the left of the monument and behind it, a flagpole. Now the British American Institute Cemetery across the road 
has a much more troubled history, which I'll describe shortly, but consists of a lawn area and a central monument with placed gravestones. In partnership with the uh, University of Western Ontario and the Sustainable Archaeology Centre, the Trust undertook an investigation of how many burials may exist below ground at the two cemeteries. So we started in 2008. The first attempt involved utilizing a gradiometer. I should say these are some of the stones that are at the BEI uh, monument. And um, a gradiometer survey in archaeology is based on the measurement of tiny anomalies in the Earth's magnetic field that are brought about by human activity. Now, the results of the gradiometer surveys at both cemeteries wasn't particularly, not very encouraging or productive and somewhat inconclusive. While there were anomalies identified, there was a great deal of um, wash because of uh, extremely high anomalies related to things such as this lovely plaque, which is metal. And the central monument actually has its concrete block with a lot of rebar in it. So the whole area around the, um, this monument in the BAI cemetery, you know, we couldn't really get many sort of indications that we were looking at um, burials. So here you can see some of the results from 2008's gradiometer survey, and there are a great deal of um, small anomalies, and some of these anomalies are likely related to uh, burial features, but it just wasn't really picking up a great deal. And for example, in the Henson Family Cemetery, everything um, related to uh, Josiah, which is right here, um, is kind of washed out. You know, we, we really weren't able to see very much. Um, everything that's in, in uh, red is either a bush or it's a, uh, a gravestone uh, at these two cemeteries. And the same thing around the monument in the center space of the BAI cemetery. Uh, a great deal of wash has happened here. Um, this area is a, an anomaly. Uh, it's not a washed out area in terms of not getting any readings, but we think it's an area of um, uh, demolition of perhaps earlier buildings in the area. And this is probably, um, well, this was interesting because at first we weren't sure what this represented. We thought it might be something that was related to a um, utility line or some sort of um, pipeline or something like that. And, and now we think differently. So while that was a little discouraging, uh, in 2011, uh, we asked the um, uh, Eddie staff uh, at Western to come back uh, with some graduate students, including Jim Karen, who's down here, um, to do a ground penetrating radar survey of the family cemetery. So this cemetery itself is about 50 meters by 50 meters and is well maintained, um, and but has a lot of obstacles, including these huge um, cedar trees, which of course in 1940s were like little bushes and that was about it. And um, a number of survey grids were established and oriented to encompass as much of the cemetery as we could while also avoiding some of these um, obstacles. And here you can see in the lower left, there are two um, relatively recent burials that are, are there. And there's another one back here as well. So the results of the GPR on the Hanson Family Cemetery recovered hundreds of high amplitude reflections. And there were also weaker, less defined reflections at greater depths. So while we weren't sure at first what we were dealing with, they all trended towards rectangular shapes and probably of different sizes, though in some cases it was hard to tell. But they all seem to be on the same alignment as the other rectangular shapes. So we feel that they're, they're less clear because coffins were buried at a greater depth near the detection limit for the instrument we were using at the time in uh, 2011. And it may also be part and due to the relative condition of the coffins because the weaker signals indicated a co coffins at a higher degree of decay. So in grid four, um, what we saw um, and you see on the left at about 
75 centimeters, we could see some very distinct rectangular shapes. These two red rectangular shapes are more recent burials. They were, you know, um, it, it, late mid to uh, mid 20th century, I'm gonna say. But when you look at the um, 150 centimeters down sort of horizontal slice of the GPR profiles, what we're seeing is we actually had more like nine burials in this area. Now, higher up, you don't really detect them, but lower down, they could be actually detected. So again, you know, trying to determine the substrata in these areas um, meant that we really had to have, get a better understanding of, of what some of these small anomalies were, like things like this were probably root systems. So we took a look at an undisturbed area uh, closer down by the parking lot. And what you see here is it's pretty much horizontal strata and just tiny little blips, which may be stones, um, or they may be very sort of weak reflections from root systems or something like that. Now, the number two is actually substrated within the cemetery. And, and this one shows um, a large number of high amplitude reflections in stark contrast to the profile above it, indicating that the entire area along this profile is disturbed and likely contains burials. And the third um, uh, sort of profile is from the northern end of the cemetery, which appears to indicate an end to the reflections within the cemetery, apart from a single grave that dates to 2006. Uh, the most recent interment in the cemetery until, well, actually quite recently. This abrupt end to the reflections may actually mark the northern limit of the historic graves, or at least a burial free strip along the, along the uh, northern edge of the cemetery before the fence line. Now here are the GPR results overall of the burials in the Henson family cemetery. It should not be treated as an exact representation of the location of individual graves because single graves at sometimes couldn't be identified due to the plethora of high amplitude readings because there were just simply too many reflections. Um, but this does appear to show rose burials representing a single, single linear high amplitude stripes in the results. So all those red areas that you see, you should be able to see some patterning happening quite uh, clearly. So they're representative of the likely density and the distribution of burials based on the extent of all these reflections visible in our data. Now, no attempt has been made to represent the different sizes of the graves in this graphical representation. Just waiting for it. There we go. That are likely, um, to exist because this wasn't possible from the data. So we used a standard size instead, um, a more or less an adult sized uh, rectangle we felt ba based on some of the known graves um, from grid four that I showed you just a few minutes ago. And, and what's interesting is we recognize that there may actually be children buried in the cemetery as well. So because of the density, it's very hard to know um, what we're dealing with. So additional GPR work in the Henson Family Cemetery was conducted in the fall of 2016 in several areas that were not surveyed in 2011. And this was due to the request by a family descendant of Josiah, his great granddaughter, um, Barbara Carter, and her daughter, Susan. Uh, it was Barbara's wish that she, her husband and daughter would be buried in the cemetery at some point. But based on what we had found in 2011, the family had concerns as to whether or not there was space for the, you know, their family in the cemetery. So now here you see, um, hmm. this is Barbara Carter on the right and her daughter, Susan. And this is a map of uh, the grid system that was put in in 2011. And what you see in red are the areas that we did additional work in 2016. So we know that we have more burials and I have to 
credit the work of Timmins Martel because we we um, contracted them to do the work for us, and it was great to have them help us out again at the site. And um, we do know, based on the GPR results, that we did have at least one possible infant burial, which had not been picked up in the 2011 results. But as you can see, we did find a couple of areas that seem to suggest that they may be um, blank areas and, and not contain any burials. So a small uh, possible area for interment uh, for the future. And of course, in 2018, this did occur um, simply because uh, Barbara's husband passed away in February and he has been interred um, in the cemetery. At some point, the cemetery is likely going to be closed by the municipality um, who actually operates it because based on our work, there isn't a lot to be seen. So the GPR that we, a survey that suggests that the Henson Family Cemetery was heavily used in the past with most of the currently defined area filled with closely um, spaced burials in regular well-maintained uh, well rows. And we think there's upwards of 300 burials in the area surveyed. But then the question arises. Sorry, I'm um, not sure I could understand that. Uh, but uh, I was going to say that um, we know that uh, we're not sure if these could all be descendants of the cemetery, the uh, Henson family, because it's 300 people. And that, that implies a great deal of descendants um, over time. So the cemetery across the road, the British American Institute, we decided that we wanted to take a look and do some um, GPR work there as well. And that work happened in the fall of 2016 and spring of 2017 uh, with the University of Toronto. Now, the British American Institute has a number of uh, early leaders of the Dawn settlement apparently buried there. Uh, these include uh, Smith, the wife of the original British American Institute trustee, Peter B. Smith, uh, Davis, including Reverend Samuel Davis of the Baptist Mission, his wife Catherine and at least one of their children, Burkett, an early merchant in Dresden, and also a Robert Burnett. Now a descendant of Robert Burnett, Hugh Burnett, in the 1950s in Dresden was instrumental during the civil rights movement in this part of the province. Those that remained in Dawn saw racial discrimination and segregation well into the 20th century. Blacks were not allowed in three of the restaurants in town, a number of stores and one of the barbershops. This led Hugh Burnett, who was a carpenter living in Dresden, to become active in the National Unity Association and anti-discrimination anti oh, I can't say that word today, discrimination group that had formed in 1948. Under Burnett's direction, the National Unity Association staged sit-ins of two restaurants, forcing a court challenge. That resulted in victory for the uh, National Unity Association and brought a legal end to overt discrimination in the province. And the Ontario Heritage Trust unveiled a provincial plaque in 2010 in Dresden, commemorating Hugh Burnett and the National Unity Association. Now we know that by the 1950s into the 1960s, the BAI cemetery had been forgotten. Um, it was basically overgrown weeds and sumac trees and bush. And a um, Reverend Jenny Johnson and her, uh, in a biography that's been written about her, co commented in 1959 that her father lay in this long forgotten burial ground having been interred there in 1870. So in around the early 1960s, Jack Thompson, who had been responsible for moving Josiah's house and creating the museum in this new location, we discovered the cemetery using a bulldozer. Now this resulted in the gravestones to be reconfigured into the central monument, regardless the work that he did was quite destructive and probably changed the landscape quite a bit. 
And also this is when the municipality became involved and took over the maintenance of the cemetery. So historically, looking at land registry records, we do know that the land was an agricultural production for a time. And it appears as a cemetery at some point in the 1860s. And it seems to have been in use at least until no later than 1914. Um, and we do know that the latest gravestone dates to 1909. The 1870s in um, Ontario saw legislation passed that required closures of church cemeteries and church run cemeteries. And this resulted in massive grave relocations into what we know of today as cemeteries run by corporations. So we know that the original location of the BAI cemetery was actually within the town of Dresden. And this removal to the new cemetery on Uncle Tom's Road occurred after the legis legislation was passed in 1874. And that meant they also moved the gravestones. However, the large number of burials in the Henson Family Cemetery now suggests that these, are not, these removals may have first occurred there. And that's who many of the people are. And in 2016, um, we did a GPR survey, but we also utilized um, additional geophysical techniques, magnetometry and electrical resistivity. So we used multiple lines of evidence to try to investigate the cemetery. And Liam Wadsworth, who you see um, is the young man on the right, had worked for me in the summer of 2016 uh, as a seasonal you know, staffer. And through his uh, professors, uh, Dr. Charles Bank and Dr. Catherine Patton, um, we started up a project that would uh, result in Liam's sort of fourth year undergraduate uh, work, uh, like a senior paper, but which also has resulted in Liam um, embarking in a, an MA and now a PhD at the University of Alberta, focusing on geophysics and archeological sites. Now the magnetic survey produced a high resolution map of all the magnetic anomalies that we knew likely existed in the cemetery, but wasn't very successful in identifying gr um, specific graves. So we'd had this problem in 2008 with the gradiometer survey. So we sort of went, all right, so what if we, you know, um, used more discrete grid points and, and compared the data? And we saw that we were just getting a, very, a lot of shallow um, anomalies that uh, may have high remnant magnetization. And as a result, they may be just artifacts that are metal or there are other man-made altered materials. It may even be simply things that are like remnant gravestones that have been destroyed during the um, discovery of the cemetery. So when we took a look at electrical resistivity, the surveys conducted on the east portion of the cemetery, which is basically that area you see in the photograph to the right, um, found that there were differences in subsurface layers that were clearly characterized by changes in resistivity. Now, this is the results of the magnetometer survey. And as you can see, again, the white area is basically indicating it's all washed out. There's too much metal. And uh, what we're seeing in terms of the red areas are more shallow um, anomalies than anything that's, that's good to take a look at. So the resistivity was set out along in the east portion of the site and, and took a good, uh, and was done in uh, the spring of 2017 as we went back. And we also then did most of the um, GPR work as well. And this is some of the um, profiles of a highly pixelated, uh, at first the, it was a software issue and then it was moved into a different software program. But at first that we could see that, you know, perhaps we were seeing better anomalies through the electrical resistivity than we had anticipated. But the GPR results were actually um, even more interesting. And here you can see um, the results of the um, GPR work that we did. And uh, this may not be the final drawing, but because we did find close to 68 grave shafts um, in the British American Institute Cemetery. And what's interesting is it, it relates very well to the number of people that are listed on the um, 
gray markers that are in the monument in the center of the site. So what we don't know though, is are there staff burials within this area and are there possibly cremations? Because you know of one cremation burial across the road at the Henson Family Cemetery. And we only know that from historical documentation. We're not quite sure where exactly it was because it wouldn't show up necessarily. Um, so this partnership with the University of Toronto's Archaeology Center and Earth Sciences Department um, is, has slightly expanded in, uh, this past year uh, because we're working with um, a, the Material Culture Studies Program out of Victoria College at the university. Um, and we're looking at a number of options um, to kind of do additional research. Um, this is a uh, after we had finished the uh, GPR work and electrical resistivity work uh, at the BAI cemetery, we actually ran a gravestone conservation workshop and had about 25 members from the surrounding community come out and um, I taught them how to clean gravestones. So I, I can help you with that if anybody has questions. Um, but it was a really good day because they, they were very interested in the work we had done and they were very interested in you know, the early cemeteries in their area and what community groups could do to actually maintain them. So if you're interested in the real nitty gritty details of the uh, work that we did at the British American Institute Cemetery, uh, we have an article that's just been published in the journal Historical Archaeology um, in it's volume three of 2020 that um, you might be able to find through um, the Springer Publishing company or the Society for Historical Archaeology, but it's highly technical. Now, the work with the Material Culture Program right now is um, going to be an ongoing partnership and we're going to be uh, having students work on de uh, developing artifact biographies. And this will be a combination of archaeological artifacts as well as part of our cultural collection that's at the site. Now, uh, here there is a, a cowrie shell from one of our other sites in Eastern Ontario, which is associated with the presence of um, slaves on the site in the 1780s. And we know that for a fact. Um, these crystals that you see in this image are actually quite interesting to me because they're very reminiscent of the types of crystals that were found in sub floor pits on uh, plantation slave quarter sites down in the Southeastern United States. We do know that there were black fur traders with the Hudson's Bay Company. And it's quite possibly because the Hudson's Bay Company at Moose Factory um, on Moose Factory Island, the Moose Fort, so to speak, uh, has an older history than the actual um, Hudson's Bay Company staff house, which was built in the 1850s. And we had 18th century deposits. So it's quite possible we are seeing the presence of slaves that might have been there in the uh, 1700s. This is a uh, manila that um, was found off a shipwreck and donated to uh, our museum, uh, the Uncle Tom's Cabin Historic Site. And then to the right of that are uh, some first editions of um, Uncle Tom's Cabin, as well as uh, Josiah Henson's autobiography. And we actually have a number of paper documents that we recently obtained through um, auction that uh, are, are basically receipts to Josiah Henson and have a signature on them. We're also looking at mapping where uh, the locations of some of the institutional features such as the sawmill, grist mill, the school were located for earmarking for future geophysical, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, geophysical projects because um, that is sort of what we're hoping to do as well as um, go more into the community for oral histories with uh, descendants and also look at some of the structures that we know may be 19th century in date and are uh, reminiscent of and or are related to the Dawn settlement itself. And of course, the original location of Josiah Henson's house. I know where it is and I have met, well, one half of the owners, um, the husband, but as we know, it's usually the wife who makes the decisions in the family. And we think that they may allow us to do some uh, geophysical work in the future. So now what I'm just going to quickly segue to is that um, we are kind of twinned with a sister site down in Maryland 
I um, uh, met the archaeologists uh, uh, Heather Boslog and Cassandra Michelle years ago, and I heard them give a paper. And I actually went to um, the Josiah Henson Museum and Park right after the property was acquired by the state. And it's Montgomery Parks, or the county of Montgomery, which um, uh, owns it and is now in the process of getting it ready to open. They had hoped to open in 2020, but with COVID, that hasn't happened, unfortunately. So this is the site of where Josiah spent um, most of his uh, teen years and early adult years up until he escaped in 1830. And it was the plantation of Isaac Riley. And uh, this house has been restored to uh, kind of more of the Bolton period, which is early 20th century. But um, they have just put in install installed uh, plaques around the property uh, so that you can see where certain um, features would have been originally located on the plantation site. It was a small tobacco farm in Maryland. And the slave quarter sites are known because Cassandra has worked in that area. And that's probably where Josiah lived. They have also recently built a, um, I believe it's, I want to say 2,900 square foot museum facility. And uh, they've restored the log cabin. Now the log cabin was the reason why the county and the state acquired the property for the exclusive price of $1 million. And only to find out after architectural historians had a look at the cabin that it dates to the 1850s. So it's not quite the time period of Josiah Henson. So it's not um, literally Uncle Tom's cabin. Uh, there may have been another structure, uh, a summer kitchen on this site because the archeology span done in the um, cabin floors did indicate earlier floor surfaces, which probably may uh, relate to an earlier version of a structure there. Um, but this is, is quite an exciting development um, for the um, property because uh, they have done a great deal of public archeology. span And uh, I'm jealous because they, they are dealing with a Henson site, which directly related to him. Um, and I should point out that if you can see my cursor, um, it's this area that is where the uh, quarter sites um, were once located. And uh, now you can see where the um, uh, sort of basic buildings on the site are. And uh, there is a small parking area and it's right by a major road and it's not difficult to find. It's in Rockland, Rockville, Maryland. So I'm gonna stop now because my voice is tired and I'm sure you may have some questions. Um, and I just wanna stop with this plate, which is um, a plate, of, a children's plate uh, that shows a scene from Uncle Tom's Cabin, uh, Harriet Beecher Stowe's novel. And this was found by Timmins Martell at the Ward site in Toronto, um, which also the Ward was, a, was basically an immigrant community, but also an area that freedom seekers uh, lived in. And I just thought it was a very nice way to end uh, my talk tonight. So I hope you enjoyed it. 